All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. The International Parking Mobility Institute presents today's learning lab, Navigating the Parking Mobility and Development Planning Journey, presented by TH Consulting, Inc. My name is Kenny, and I'll be assisting in moderating today's presentation. As a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded. We will make the recording available online on IPMI's YouTube channel within a few days. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping rules for today. This learning lab will last 60 minutes with a Q&A session at the end. If you have questions for today's speakers, please feel free to queue up the questions at any time by typing in the chat. We will get to as many as time allows. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jim Zulo, CAP, President, THA Consulting. Jim specializes in studies, planning, and managing parking resources and infrastructure. Jim previously served as Senior Director of Real Estate and Economic Development for the New Jersey Transit, the third largest transit agency in the United States. Jim has served as Vice President of the New Brunswick Development Corporation, a nonprofit real estate corporation, and Executive Director of the New Brunswick Parking Authority. He serves on the Board of the Director of the New York State Parking and Transportation Association. Jim shares experience and expertise in real estate and parking planning to foster greater economic development with a, with a particular focus on transit-oriented development. Jim, the audience is all yours. Uh, thank you so much, Ke Kenny, and I want to thank everybody else uh, for joining us again today uh, and IPMI for hosting this event. Uh, today, we are speaking about navigating the parking facility planning and development journey. Uh, we, as parking professionals, are often confronted with the question uh, or the we need a parking facility. So we thought it would be a good idea to kind of take you, take our group here today through the various steps of that analysis to determine whether or not you actually do need a facility. And if you do, some of the best practices for planning and design. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just I'll, I'll spare everybody a, 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 kind of the THA sales pitch, but um, we are a firm that's been specializing in parking for about 30 years. Uh, and one of the things I think we do focus on, we recognize that parking just isn't about warehousing cars anymore, that when we undertake our planning and design initiatives, we really look at the facility serving as a gateway to the campus, to the downtown, to the new development that's being proposed. And um, we also feel that really design matters. Parking facilities built and designed well today are gonna last 50, 60, 70 years. They're gonna be with your community. Uh, for, for that amount of time, and it's really important that they're done right. So I want to give you, next slide, please, a quick uh, uh, introduction to our speakers. Uh, Todd Helmer is our CEO, CEO of THA Consulting. Todd has over 25 years in the parking and design business. He's a registered, uh, or he is an uh, um, uh, engineer, and uh, has uh, served as PM on, PM on multiple projects and has great expertise in design and functional planning of new facilities. Uh, Vicki Gagliano is our Director of Parking Planning and Mobility and Consulting. Vicki has been with the firm for approximately 18 years, has worked all throughout the United States on co conducting studies uh, related to parking planning and design. And Jonathan Schisler is uh, our Director of Design. He's been in the uh, industry as well for over 18 years. He has a Bachelor of Architecture and uh, is a really uh, expert in planning, functional planning of garages and parking facilities uh, throughout, our, throughout our region. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just give you a quick overview before I hand it over to Vicki to, uh, uh, to, for her component. First, we wanna look here, is there really a need? And that's what Vicki's gonna speak to. She's gonna look at the studies and the efforts that she does to determine if a downtown, if a college campus, if a healthcare facility does need a new parking facility and what are some of the tools that she uses to analyze that. Uh, upon that, if there is a determination that there is a need for new parking based on future growth and things of that nature, uh, John is gonna speak to what are the principles that he evaluates in one, selecting a site and often looking at different sites, some of which aren't idea, how you incorporate different analyses to identify and to fit the most efficient parking facility. And then Todd will speak to some of the design trends that have been incorporated into parking and mixed use facilities for some time now and that are very, very important to kind of, again, contributing to the aesthetic appeal of your campus, your downtown or whatever project that the parking infrastructure is supporting. Lastly, we'll conclude with 
we've got you know potentially a need for the new garage and but let's understand the cost implications again we are confronted oftentimes with clients who are feel they need a parking facility and uh, the, ultimately they may need that but then the other reality is how much will it cost what does it take in revenue to support it and what are some of the strategies that are there so with that i will now turn it over to vicky who will go into uh her, her analysis to understand the, the actual need for new parking. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Jim. So we're starting out, we say we need a parking study. Okay, well, what's, our, what's the true reason for this? Next slide. You know, what are the two or three primary objectives for doing this study? And where do we need to look at? Where are we evaluating? Um, do we need to focus the study on just a few blocks surrounding a downtown core? Or do we really look at, need to look at an entire town? Um, including some of the outskirts. So really defining what that study area is and what are these primary objectives of the study is key to starting and understanding how we want to structure the parking study around it. Um, the more defined and refined, the better because you can eliminate a lot of the, the other noise. So in other words, if we're doing a parking study in the downtown area, we may want to not include some of the residential parking streets because those aren't something that we would recommend as an alternative for people to park in if there is a shortage. Um, so we're looking at that. We're looking at the supply and the inventory collection. We wanna look at the parking supply that is relevant for your effort. If this is something that's having a public parking you know, shortage right now, or you think there's a public parking shortage, we might wanna exclude things like private residential parking components in that area. Um, likewise, if we're looking on a, on a university campus and we're looking at student parking, we may want to exclude certain areas that are used for facilities management and things like that, where it's not really practical to put students on a campus. So we really want to define who, who, the air, who the users are that we're looking at as part of that goal setting process, and then collect the parking data that's relevant for those users. As we go through, we're going to understand what kind of parking exists in, in this study area. What type is it on street, off street surface lots? And then also, is it paid or is it free? Are there any restrictions or user assignments? We compile all that data to get our baseline parking um, inventory number that we will use as the first building block for this process. After that, we really wanna go out and start looking at data and demand and how many people are parking in all of these areas. So we wanna look at which days and which times do we wanna focus on. It's really um, important to not just gather data for the sake of gathering data um, and really focus on those peak days and times that are most critical for your operation. And most of the times when, when we're meeting and starting these processes, immediately somebody says every Thursday it is busy because uh, the hospital has extra meetings on campus every, Wednesday, every Thursday and everything just sort of builds up at that time. So understanding one of those days and times and then building your data collection around those days and times so that we can really understand how parking is functioning during that time. There's a couple of things that we wanna make sure we're capturing here. And the first thing is uh, like a missing demand. And so that sometimes people will park outside of the study area. I was doing a hospital study and there was a lot of par parking occurring on a street that was outside off campus. And so I wanted to go ahead and capture that information because that was demand that was associated with that campus and excluding it would be underestimating how many parking spaces are really needed. The other thing is looking at false demand. And sometimes I'll do a study in an area and there may be a specific user assignment for a parking area, but other people are currently using that lot. And so it's good when you're out there doing that data collection effort to also perform these observations to understand if there are certain things like that going on when you're doing these studies so that you can adjust your numbers. So if I'm doing a hospital study and I see that patient visitor lot, is getting filled by people exiting their cars and scrubs, I can ask the client, what's going on? Is this a policy that's, that's currently been modified to allow this? Or is this people that are just parking here because they're, they're choosing to park closer to the door? So really looking at what's going on and asking a lot of the whys. Why are people doing certain things as you collect this information? And then we come up with essentially the parking demand information. Now, we wanna look at that baseline condition. So we're gonna take that parking supply we're going to adjust it down a little, which is called an effective parking supply, which is just a cushion so that when people are going into a, a parking area or a downtown area, they're not getting frustrated on having to find the last few parking spaces. So that's a cushion to allow for them to, to find those spaces and improve their the overall experience. 
And so we're gonna take that reduced effective supply and compare it against that current parking demand. And that's gonna get us a number. If it's positive, we have a parking surplus. If it's negative, we have a parking shortage. And so we take that and that's our current day conditions and we use that as our first building block. Next. Now taking that information that we just established with our current, we're gonna build on top of that with our, our future conditions. So a lot of times we wanna look at what's our timeline? What's the horizon that we wanna look out? Do we wanna look at something that's five or 10 years or is somebody really desiring something up to 20 years? Knowing that the farther out we go, the, the less um, precise these projections are gonna be. Um, the other thing is we know project delays are, are often common. So if you have something that's projected to happen in 16 years, there's a chance that that timeline is going to get adjusted as well. And we all know that the impact of things that are unexpected like the pandemic can really turn our industry upside down. So we really try to keep these projections no longer to five to 10 years because that's when we can really accurately or somewhat accurately provide some projections. Um, and then we're looking at what's gonna happen. What are these projects? What are the, what's planned in the area? And a lot of times it's not just what's planned. It's a building here and it's this many square feet. We need to really understand what's going on and why is it occurring? Is it an office building that's being built downtown? What is it being built for? Is it being built to accommodate an existing office building and they're moving over because they have outgrown their space? Is this a new business that's coming in? And really understanding all of the details as to what's happening here. And is anything happening to where they were previously if they're within the study area? So if it's somebody relocating from one portion of the study area to another, what's going to backfill that space as well? So really looking at the cumulative effect of all of these projects and sometimes it really goes down a lot more deeper than just parking. You know, if you have things on university campus, which are uncommon, you know, one school may build a new building, but there's other schools that are backfilling their old space. So you may not only need to look at a new engineering building, but you'll need to look at the three other schools that are relocating and sizing up as well to see how those are all impacting the campus. And then there may be a new program coming into the smallest building that was displaced. So it's more than just one building, one square foot. You really need to understand all the intricacies of what these projects are, are going to do to the area, how it's shifting from today, and then it, it can operate all of those factors when you're projecting the demand. When will they occur? Are, is there a timeline? Is there, are they going to occur on an existing parking lot? Are they going to be displaced? Who are the users that are using those spaces today? We wanna understand that if the hospital is building on a patient parking lot, it's important to note that they're losing 300 spaces, but it's equally important to understand that those spaces are being used today by the patients and visitors, because as a hospital is making their plans, they will need to relocate those somewhere. And as everybody knows, patients and visitors typically want to park closer to the door because of various mobility reasons, especially on a hospital campus. Um, and now we're, we're starting to build on that. We look at, is there a normal growth factor in the area? Are, are residents, you know, is, is the residents and the number of people coming into an area increasing significantly? Or is this an area that's pretty steady with the growth? Because we can always increase, increase, increase the demand according to that factor as well. Um, and now we start looking at what is that, that future demand? And everybody always asks, what's the standard? What's the rule of thumb I can apply to my 30,000 square foot building that I'm gonna put downtown? and there is no standard or rules of thumb. You know, we have to look at everything individual. A study area of Tampa, Florida and a study area of New York have two different, completely different characteristics. I know if you're building residential in Tampa and you're building residential in New York, the amount of parking spaces per residential unit are different. Likewise, if I'm building something that's for a luxury high-end residential component versus affordable housing, I'm also gonna get that same differential. So we not only need to look at what it is, but where it is, the demographics, the socioeconomic you know, conditions of those dem demographics so that we can really hone in on what's an appropriate ratio. And I will say a lot of times when we're doing these studies, we can look at the existing conditions. This is really true on a university campus where we have a defined number of student enrollment and we can look at those vehicles and their student parking lots and get a decent ratio for how they're operating today. And assuming in the future they're going to continue operating in that same fashion, we can estimate how many new cars you're going to need based on the enrollment growth. So there's instances like that. For downtowns, a lot of times we will look at ULI and ITE, but again, this is a starting point. 
we have to go beyond just those base ratios because every location, every municipality has different walkability, has different transit options. And we need to look at all of those as well as our project and uses. If we're doing a hospital, people will not be coming to the hospital, even if it's in New York City and arriving at the ER by train. It's not likely most people are going to still drive in, even though there's great transit service in New York. And, you know, we need to look at all of these things and understand who's going where and how they can move around on that. Um, so we build on these information and we use it on that building blocks on the current. So we have our current information that we started with. We add on the parking that's going to be added. We add on the demand according to our projection. And we get that cumulative need and compare it against the cumulative supply. And that's going to help us understand where are we going to be in the future and do we need additional parking. Next. Now, often we'll see a parking shortage, and the planner in me puts my planning hat on and says, can everything be utilized better? Um, is all of the parking infrastructure being effect efficiently and effectively utilized? Um, will adjusting the rates, if they have rates, or the user assignments allow for a better distribution of parking demand? And then looking at if adjusting even time limits and turnover of some of those parking areas will increase the utilization of your, your parking assets. Really, we want to maximize what you have today because that is the least expensive path forward to meeting demand. Um, we want to look at a lot of times the parking rules. Are parking rules being enforced and followed? Um, can changes in operations be implemented that are low cost that can essentially increase your utilization throughout your downtime? You may have a parking lot on the outskirts that's not well utilized, but if you increase your parking rates in the core, maybe more users will park there. So how can you do some of these strategies to distribute your utilization and maximize all of the existing resources? Um, and then we also want to look at shared parking. Is there an ability to share parking, you know, with other users and other, you know, facilities, private owners? We're working on a study outside of Miami and there is a bank. And at this time, that bank does not want anybody to park in their lot after hours, even though it sits completely vacant. So what kind of things can be done between the municipality and the bank to create an agreement where that facility can be used to accommodate some of the evening restaurant users? And it's not going to negatively impact the bank. So what can we do there? Do we need to look at some policies and maybe potential ways to, creative ways to get agreements between all the parties to maximize all this infrastructure that is existing today? And then you can also look at your own facility. If you have a garage that's serving an office building, that could also be utilized to provide residential parking for overnight guests or for the overnight residents. And looking at things like that to maximize the use of all your existing infrastructure as much as possible. We go into mobility and transit and how that can help with reducing demand and, and basically getting people to your location without driving a vehicle. We have to understand what type of service exists today. Is it a high level of service or is it really inconvenient? I know in a lot of Florida cities, people don't even consider public transportation because it's very, very poor and inconvenient. But in the, and there's areas that public transportation is incredible and you don't need a vehicle. So really understanding what's there, how can it be maximized and the demographics. What type of, of ridership are they seeing? Are they growing and expanding? Do they have the funding to continue their same level of service or have they been operating on some subsidies that may expire and it would get eliminated or decreased? So we really under, need to understand the transit system and how it is going to be evolving over the next years. We saw with the pandemic, a lot of ridership on trains decreased. People were working for a home for a while. And then when they came back, a lot of them preferred to use um, Ubers and Lyfts to get around just because it minimized how many people they were in contact with that they didn't know. Um, the other thing is looking at the options that are out there and is it, is it, um, is it appropriate for all of the user groups? If you have an older demographic, if you're in Sarasota, Florida, you're probably not going to get a lot of utilization on scooters or e-bikes in your downtown area. Whereas in other areas, you may, but most senior citizens aren't going to grab on, jump onto a scooter to, to traverse around a downtown area. So really looking at the area, the users, the demographics, and then looking at the transit options that are most suitable for them to make sure that they're appropriate and that they can be effective at reducing that demand. Um, other ways of it is increasing your parking rates. I did a hospital study outside of Washington, and it was less expensive for the employees to drive into work and park for free in a lot 
than it was for them to get on the, the train and come to work, even though there was a shuttle. So in that case, they were being disincentivized to use transit. So what can you do to encourage those users to get on the transit services? Because it's a lot less expensive maybe to subsidize and provide an incentive program than it is to build a garage just for everybody that wants to come into work. The goal here is really to try to reduce the demand to the greatest extent possible and maximize everything out there that exists today. Next. And I'm gonna turn it over to John to give out his ideas for when we need parking on how to plan it out. Thank you, Vicki, appreciate it. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So Vicki's kind of giving you some background about, you know, how to figure out, you know, how much parking you might need or and to incentivize it. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, you know, when you realize that you need structured parking because you just don't have enough, maybe surface lot or something. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, the garage design and give you a little bit of background. So next slide, please. Um, so really what we're trying to look for is, you know, maybe you have one site, maybe you have multiple sites. When you're trying to figure out where you want to place a parking structure, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, wants to go into the thought process of where that wants to be. Um, you know, really the parking is going to be the gateway, as Jim had said earlier, to this destination that everybody's going to. So you want to make, be able to make that a pleasant experience for everyone that's coming to that, to that destination. Um, try and make it some sort of a, a placemaking scheme where maybe there's something involved with it where there's outdoor seating or a park or something that makes it, you know, a really gives a really lasting impression of that first impression that you're that you're trying to create with parking. Um, you want to think about what are the adjacent destinations and connections that are around the area. Um, why are people coming there, and how do you how do you how do you make them want to stay? Um, another thing you want to think about is is there an opportunity to do some sort of mixed use incorporation into the facility? In a lot of urban conditions, you want to try and keep that street landscape along the sidewalk. Do you want to incorporate some sort of retail or commercial use at that ground tier of the structure so that the walkability maintains along the sidewalk? Um, sometimes you have a certain size site and it's you know really large and you want to think about, you know, do I really want to utilize that entire site to create a parking structure or do I want to try and you know build a structure that leaves some extra space for either future development or just another development that's there? You know, what, what size is that lot? What else can we do with that? site rather than just to create some sort of a parking garage for the storage of vehicles. Um, you want to think about access and egress, and that comes down to the vehicular standpoint and the and the pedestrians that are using those facilities. Something that's really important um, about these types of designs is thinking about, you know, that vehicular and pedestrian conflict, something that is very different about uh, designing a parking structure versus other things are that, that conflict in there and trying to minimize the pedestrian and vehicular conflict of the things that are around there. Um, and that really goes into the location of your stand elevator towers, you know, and having, you know, great pedestrian connections as far as that's concerned. Sometimes um, in urban conditions or other conditions, you know, a bridge, some sort of pedestrian bridge connection at a higher level or a, a structure tier of the garage makes sense for some of those things. Um, you wanna take into consideration, is there being parking that's displaced? Are you building on a surface lot to do structured parking or is it, you know, in the middle of the field somewhere. So it's definitely something that is going to go into um, the overall cost consideration of the project. And then really just facade design, how that impacts the site. You know, what does everything look like around? Is it in a historic district? Um, those are some of the things that you really want to take into consideration. Um, parking garages nowadays, sometimes there's zoning that goes along with it where, you know, they require it not to look like a parking garage. Um, and, you know, we're always trying to think of ways to, you know, make these things look a lot nicer than what they used to be designed, you know, 20 and 30 years ago. Um, can go to the next slide. So here a little bit, you know, trying to go about the planning aspect. So once you kind of have an idea of, you know, what the background is of, you know, why you might want to select a site, um, you really got to look into other things about those particular sites. Um, zoning is a really big one. Zoning can get really into parking space sizes, um, height restrictions, um, other code requirements, 
that are there, setbacks, you know, you really have to kind of look at those things to initiate that process of what you're doing. There's setbacks as far as where vehicles can enter and, and adjacencies to intersections, things like that, that you really need to understand before you can really start laying something out. Um, the height restrictions can be something that goes along with zoning, but also you kind of want to like the context of the different buildings that are around that you don't want to build this behemoth structure that is just going to dwarf all the other things around it. You want to respect the other types of buildings that are around the area um, as far as that goes. Entry exit locations. You know, we want to look at what is the what is the path of vehicle circulation around the site, not just that like specific site, but you know, how are people traveling to and from this? What makes the most sense from a circulation standpoint to be able to um, design those things appropriately? Um, the other thing that you really want to consider is something like a floor to floor height for a garage. Um, you can design it for the typical clearances that are designed by code. But if you want to design a garage that is going to have some other type of space, typically that might be on the ground tier, you got to incorporate those types of things in the floor to floor height, which is automatically going to affect the ramping system uh, that's inside the garage. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. So here's where I'll talk a lot. A lot of questions that uh, we get is somebody, a client will bring a site to us and say, can I build a garage on this site? Um, even if we weren't part of the selection process. And the answer is almost always, yes, you can build something, but really it comes down to at what cost? And this is kind of really what I call the fun part of the overall design. So this is what I really enjoy about doing this type of stuff. Um, there's a lot of thought process that goes into this and a lot of kind of standards that you need to kind of understand and look at. But one of the kind of buzzwords that you might experience in talking to uh, a design firm or consulting firm that talks about parking structures is understanding like what the efficiency is of a parking garage. So the efficiency means it's the square foot of the garage divided by how many spaces you're gonna get on the tier. And it's a really simple number to calculate. If you're designing for an efficient garage, you're designing somewhere on that typical tier around a 300 to 320 square foot per level. If you're getting something like those numbers, you're designing an efficient garage. But what does it mean to design an efficient garage? Um, typically, it, what it means is you're designing a garage that's going to have a ramp that you're able to park on. All the square footage inside the garage is basically parkable with the exception of the drive aisles that are there. So when you have an efficient garage, you're designing parking on both sides of a drive aisle. There's something called like a parking module, which basically means, you know, you have a maybe an 18 foot deep space, a 24 foot drive on another 18 foot deep space, probably the most common parking module of parking garage design that's out there. I mean, there's plenty of other ones, but if you're designing something of parking on both sides of the drive aisle, as well as around the turns, what is called the end bay of the garage, you're designing somewhat of efficient garage. Um, so that's something to really you know, know the background of when you're talking to somebody about designing a parking garage for you is really just how efficient it can actually be. Um, so, so I gave you some common dimensions as far as, as far as those things go. Another thing to really consider is really just some of the, the traffic flow inside of the garage. What might make the most sense for the different types of users that are using this garage? Um, sometimes decisions are made from a one way or, or a two way traffic flow of the garage because of certain widths and things that you have on a structure. There are certain sizes that are going to work well for a structure and those sizes directly correlate to the cost of what that structure is going to cost. That efficiency number that I talked about directly correlates to the cost of the structured parking that you're designing for. Um, and just to kind of finish out here is I, I put up a couple of pictures of kind of different ramping systems inside of uh, garages. So the one on the left here, typically when you have a shorter site for a garage, you need to kind of condense what the ramp is. You have a lot more sloped parking in a garage type like this. We see this a lot in urban conditions because we just can't get 
a length where you're able to slope up one entire level with one ramp and be able to have a flat bay on the other side. So you need to design a garage like this. I like in this ramping design, it's kind of like a, a, a scissor stair. You know, there's an intermediate landing every time you make that turn. So a garage that's designed like this, that's still very efficient footprint, um, is, is, you know, something that can help utilize a, a certain site that's maybe a little bit smaller. The one on the top right hand corner, you know, we didn't have a lot of width for a garage like this. It's going to be a little bit of a less of efficient garage because you need to accommodate less width. You're not able to have parking on both sides of the drive aisle that there. So we need to incorporate some sort of a speed ramp. But this was the site that was selected. Um, so yes, definitely you can design something, but it's going to be a little bit more it's going to be a little less efficient than, you know, something we're able to get parking on both sides of a drive. And then the last picture on the bottom right hand side, um, this is a ramping system that's called a double threaded helix. And really some, to utilize something like this, and you, typically it's utilized in a one way parking scheme. Probably anybody that's parked in a garage has been in a garage like this. Um, really, it goes up. This is something when you have taller garage of some sort, when you have a lot of parking, like say if you're going up to a thousand space garage or something, you have a ramping system like this, because every time you make a turn, you're going up a different level uh, within a garage. So um, just some of the different things to think about as far as the design goes. I think you can go to the next slide and Todd will start talking about trends in parking design. Great, great. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, parking as placemaking, you know, we've heard this before, but as Vicki and John mentioned, right sizing uh, to support shared needs and proper siting uh, is the first, certainly the first step in the process. Um, you'll see through this component that there is an experiential aspect to parking that should be integrated uh, with thoughtful aesthetic design offering an inviting and interesting uh, experience. You know, one of the things I wanted to mention before we move on is that, you know, activating the streetscape that, that's... Um, you know, that was mentioned once, but while identifying access points to parking and pedestrian destination points is really important for the adjacent uses and uh, good urban planning. Next, please. Um, architectural design. It starts with the vertical element and, and it starts with the building envelope um, um, as, as, as the uh, aesthetic approach uh, starts to unfold. Uh, facade, uh, facade aesthetics is obviously uh, very important. Uh, there's a variety of applications that can be employed. Um, you know, John mentioned a little bit about historic districts, but, you know, now you're starting to see and have, you know, parking structures become much more of, of an amenity. Um, authorities having jurisdiction, historic districts, redevelopment zones, uh, ordinances, they do continue to evolve, um, you know, and offer and desire more aesthetics. Um, you know, one, one important aspect to uh, facade design as, as it's, uh, is, is essentially in the building envelope as how it extends uh, internally. Uh, there's the vertical application, but it should extend into interior access points and essentially offer you know, continuity uh, to those pedestrian areas. One thing to keep in mind when planning uh, any application to a parking garage uh, is the openness. Um, and making sure that, you know, you're maintaining openness, um, you know, obviously there's densities of materials and et cetera, um, but those calculations need to be certainly done up front. Last thing I'll say for um, architectural design is uh, designing a functional and efficient and cost-effective structure itself will then allow you the opportunity to offer other aesthetic opportunities, right, um, and use that money and capital for that. Next, please. Uh, mixed use, mixed use integration. This is something that uh, obviously continues uh, to evolve and somewhat rapidly. Um, you know, many of the uh, mixed use aspects in garages can, you know, be of the form of retail, residential, grocery, medical, and so forth. And um, you know, one thing to just be uh, you know cognizant of is is when you're you know, sitting down and owners with clients uh, is to become. Uh, you know, knowledgeable and responsive to potential community and adjacent needs that that could use some of the real estate in in, in a parking structure. Um, some things to consider, obviously, floor to floor heights, use occupancy, fire ratings, vibration, etc. So, 
proper planning of mixed use up front in the project uh, planning stages and schematic is, is critical. Next, please. Um, some uses, as you can see on the screen, um, related to employing those uses, it's very important uh, to make sure that conceptual planning through the CDs certainly captures, captures those costs. Um, you have many clients where they may have existing space that will be then transferred into a new structure. Uh, desk audits of that space and the programmatic determination is very important, uh, as well as how the function and the flow and the operations of the internal uh, user uh, experience is defined. Lastly, I'll mention related to um, integration of uses here is the durability design of the envelope. Um, you know, whether it's under slab, whether it's overhead, uh, it's just to make sure that, you know, this is a long-term asset that needs to be addressed and protected. Um, and you want to minimize any long-term maintenance and issues within occupied space. Next, please. This is an example of a project that has many different uses, right? Um, the point of bringing this up is to make sure that the uh, a, a comprehensive code analysis and, and associated cost analysis is done up uh, in, the, in the early stages. Fire separations, occupancy, egress calculations, obviously very important. When you start integrating mixed use into a public uh, component, there might be a par public uh, parking component with private, potentially like residential, secure areas and the delineation between the public and private uh, becomes very important. Next, please. Multimodal, multimodal in transit. Um, ground level integration, you know, for various transportation modes, um, you know, it creates this multimodal center. You know, within urban areas, you'll see it quite a bit, dense urban areas and, and obviously uh, in larger campus environments. Um, bus and transit hubs, you know, when you design these, you know, make sure that they're user friendly. Now, the waiting areas and the amenities uh, are nicely defined. You have shuttle stops, bike areas, charging stations, drop off, etc. Um, talked a little bit about the um, you know the first floor, um, but some other things to consider when incorporating multimodal is enhanced lighting where it's located, ventilation, fire separation, and I also mentioned about the durability uh, as well. Next, amenities, amenity decks, top level parking structure, real estate. How is that to be defined? You know, um, there's parking, there's obviously photovoltaic arrays that can be incorporated. Um, and what you find in, in many uh, private residential uses, uh, as well as some public use, is use of the top level is a great opportunity for a user amenity. Um, obviously, the most important factor there is to understand the, the cost and the return on the investment of this space that you're creating. Um, high level durability design is required. You wanna add life to, again, to the parking asset and minimize uh, future maintenance. Next, please. Interior aesthetic upgrades. You know, we talked earlier about the, the vertical application and the aesthetic design that should be transferred horizontally uh, into the pedestrian nodes, stair elevator towers. Um, floor, ceiling, and wall finishes um, really should have a clean look. Uh, it is important you know, for the pedestrians to feel feel that cleanliness and, and uh, safety. Minimizing any surface-mounted conduits and incorporating vertical chases is, uh, is a way to accommodate that. And I'll say that, you know, there's many impactful things that can be done, whether it's at entry exits or whether it's at lobby areas economically. So, uh, again, you know, when you're when you're employing these things, you know, think of the design and the built environment later um, and the future maintenance in mind. Every presentation, uh, obviously, in our industry, you know, focuses obviously on the passive and active security. It's become very, very uh, important and always has been uh, clear and visible paths of travel for pedestrians and maximizing the transparency and glazing opportunities to greatest extent. Uh, should be considered. Um, sterile elevator lobby areas, as I just mentioned, well lit. Implement active measures as necessary and seen fit but with the owner. Next, please. Branding opportunities. 
vehicular entry exit points um, are and, and portals are great opportunities to offer a, a most inviting experience when it comes to that. So I would say, you know, in the design, look for those opportunities for advertisement, for in, incorporating patron information, um, entry exit areas, and as I mentioned, stair elevator towers, uh, waiting areas for branding, obviously well lit. Um, look for those opportunities uh, when you put the uh, branding theory and philosophy together for the project. Thoughtful and clear signage is critical. First of all, signage that's very readable, most important, don't oversign. Uh, strategically locate signage, you know, understand the structure and the other architectural elements uh, so that you can employ that properly. Signage materials and finishes uh, employ low maintenance finishes and uh, think about the potential of uh, vandalism uh, as well. One of the approaches that we should all take in our industry too is to take a look at the holistic aspect of uh, signage and look at it from the site, the adjacencies, vehicular entry exit portals, moving on into the interior parking uh, in lobby areas. One of the most important things is um, you know, when a signage package is complete, uh, is to make sure that during construction, there's a pre-installation walkthrough with the signage contractor to ensure proper placement and visibility of signs. Next, please. Advertising and art opportunities. Um, you know, just another opportunity um, create, does create an aesthetic, but there are applications for banners, scrims, and the like. Um, also, I would encourage, look at the opportunity for public art uh, on site. I know that some ordinances require that there be a certain percentage of public art, uh, but be mindful and thoughtful in the initial design uh, that those types of applications will be employed and even potentially uh, engage the, the art community. Lastly on this, uh, depending on the volume of vehicular and or pedestrian traffic, look at incorporating message boards and LED screens it's a potential to monetize uh, the asset. Next, please. Sustainability. Um, you know, John, John and Vicky had talked about this related to um, right sizing, densifying, reducing the footprint, uh, good parking planning, good urban planning. Um, but then also there's that, there's the aspect of incorporating sustainable designs, whether they're inherent. Uh, or there's some cost to those into the parking structure. Uh, I would say that it's very important early in the process to identify what sustainable initiatives and design components are going to be in the structure um, and as end related costs uh, are, are critical as well. Next. Um, you know, obviously just a continuation in, in our industry, we've heard quite a bit about EVs. Um, you know, obviously ordinances are changing, you know, require certain percentages. Uh, clients are being mindful of this more, um, not just the initial day installs, but, but also the future provisions and uh, to have the structure as EV ready. Obviously, there are certain things to consider now in terms of designing where they're located, accommodating the weights, uh, as well as fire considerations. Next, please. I won't talk too much about parking technology and operations, but what I will say, this is this is something obviously we all know in the industry is advancing uh, fairly rapidly. Um, you know, employ uh, technology uh, to maximize the parking operations. That's really important. But make sure that when we design parking structures, that the technology is determined up front, right, and planned accordingly. Uh, the built condition of a garage many times um, it needs to accommodate even a change of thought and, and in terms of flexibility, you know, you know, case in point, LPR, dimensional aspects, and so forth. Next. Lastly, I will end on this slide, which uh, uh, speaks to long-term durability and asset management. Um, as, as, as designing structures, you know, we know that there's structural system selection and there's drainage design as the first uh, line of defense in terms of protecting your asset and minimizing water ponding. Um, make sure, number two, that you know, long-term durability is, is expressed in any type of occupied space envelope and design. 
Also look at life cycle analysis, you know, determine the extent of concrete admixtures and the like. You know, parking structures nowadays, especially with the incorporation of mixed use, we have to really consider that as being a long-term asset given. Um, so think about that as well. Uh, capital reserve allocation, periodic walkthroughs after occupancy, um, and, uh, and a specific project-specific maintenance manual uh, given the, the parking structure system and related components. So with that, I will turn it back to Vicki. Thank you, Todd. Um, running through this, I know it says a uh, step four of this journey, but at the end of the day, who's going to pay for all of these recommendations, which are great and look fantastic, but somebody has to end up paying for these. So we want to find out our funds already earmarked in some location that can be used. Do all of the funding need to be generated as part of this project? We'll start out looking at a market analysis. What does the current market dictate today? Does paid parking already exist in this area? If so, what are the rates? Are we looking at a location where hourly rates are 50 cents for an hour? Or are we looking at a place where we're looking at an hourly rate of $5? Because that does impact how much revenue this facility could potentially generate. Um, the same for your permit rates. Um, we want to know who are the users that are we're looking to accommodate and are they price sensitive? Um, also looking at is there an existing surplus or shortage in the demand? So as parking demand increases, the price tends to increase as well and the acceptance of higher rates increases. Um, is there any pent up demand? Because all of these things factor into what type of user groups and volume of users we can look at, at for this facility. And then what does that future component look like that we were talking about early on? what programs and projects are, are occurring in an area that are going to increase demand and impact demand and maybe even change how the demand functions in that area. And a lot of times we're looking at a few major primary sources of revenue. The first is that facility generator revenue, which is your hourly rates, sometimes your daily rates for university campuses. We're looking at permits often. Um, are there any fees or taxes that can be used? And a lot of municipalities do use things like splash funds. Universities often have um, parking fees associated with each credit hour that will go to help fund and offset the cost associated with operating parking and transportation. So what exists there? If, you're, if you have access to someone that is um, versed to grants and federal programs, you can also often tap into some of those funds, but you do often need somebody with that experience in, in writing and applying for those programs. Um, but most often than not, it's, it's an organizational effort to fund parking changes such as the ones discussed. We're looking at net revenues from an entire system getting pulled into one space to offset the cost of these improvements. You know, I, again, this is listed as step four, but really I think it's important to start considering all of these factors and access to funds early in the process so that you have an idea of what type of budget you're looking at and what types of funding is available. Because the last thing you wanna do is go through this whole exercise to realize that this is what you want, but there's no funding capabilities of, of available to you. Next. I'm going to keep this very brief. This is a quick example of a parking perform, a very brief one. We're looking at a facility, 500 parking spaces above grade, nothing, you know, subterranean with the modest facade, which is not most of the ones that Todd went through. His were pretty nice with a modest facade um, that does not have a physical cashier present. So a lot of this will be automated. Um, we're looking at estimated costs. These are gonna vary by region, by contractor, by construction method, and even by, by time, because again, supply demand will dictate pricing. Um, land costs here, we're showing a zero dollar. This is assuming that you own this land. Now, just because I have a zero here does not mean that there is not an opportunity cost that is lost and sacrificed as part of building parking on any type of land. Um, so we're, here, we're showing a zero dollar because that's your cost, but your municipality may also forfeit some property tax revenue that could be generated if it was used for a higher and better use. So it's always good to consider the big picture of that as well. We're looking at a construction cost all in of $35,000 per space, hard plus soft cost. And that gets us just about $17.5 million in construction costs for the garage. Now I'm looking at debt service. I'm assuming this location has a good credit rating and can get a cost of capital around 
that debt term is going to be 30 years, which is very typical and standard for parking garages, even though they may well outlast that time frame. And we're looking at an annual debt service payment of 1.27 million for this facility, which when I break it down into per space per month costs, we're looking at about $212 per space per month in debt service. And I really like to focus on this monthly cost because that translates the most with a lot of users because we're looking at monthly permits and we can gauge that against where we are in the market. Um, we go from our debt service to our operating expenses. I'm looking at around $400 per space. Again, no cashiers in the system, but that's gonna cover all of your typical maintenance, your cleaning, your utilities, um, your lighting and everything like that. So then we go through that and we're looking at around $400 per space. So the facility is around 200,000 a year which puts us again at that monthly per space at $33 per space to cover your operating expenses for this one. We also want to always budget and put some money away in for structural maintenance. Now these facilities aren't going to need that in the first several years, but it will come a time where we need to do some replacements of joints and maybe uh, toppings and sealants and stuff like that. And so we wanna make sure that those funds are available. So we're recommending for this example, $100 per space per year to be budgeted and set aside in a reserve fund. That way those reserves can be tapped into when needed and they will slowly build up over time. Again, we break that down to that monthly cost and that puts us around $8. So we're looking at an annual cost for this facility to operate is around 1.5 million per year, which breaks down into $254 per space per month. Now we can compare that easily against what your current rates are in your market. If you are under 254, which a lot of markets are, you may need to go back and look at how can we you know, bridge this gap here? Fortunately, a lot of times the system will cover the cost of these things. Um, but unfortunately, we do a lot of these analysis to show elected officials or higher administrative people who want a garage why it's difficult and why we need to look at other options first or which funding mechanisms we need to tap into to make sure it can be subsidized. Um, but they're used all the time now. One thing I like this shows as well is if somebody says we have federal funding available and we can get all of the construction costs paid for, well, now all of a sudden that operating expense and structural reserves are the only things left and a $40 monthly permit rate can almost cover that in, in whole. So we really want to understand what's available out there because that can make the difference between making this feasible or not feasible. But at the end of the day, there's always options and we can always look at different alternatives. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, so um, that is the uh, summation of our, our uh, learning lab. We, again, we really want to thank you. I think Ken has indicated there are a couple of questions in the chat box. So, Ken, I don't know if you'll... Um... Yep. yep, I got it. Jim, thanks. Okay. And thank you thank to you. our presenters uh, uh, for uh, that presentation. And yes, I do have a few questions for everybody here. Uh, Marietta asks, how is the consideration of future use change taken into consideration in the planning stage and what have been the most realistic options of conversion so far, e.g. parking to storage versus parking to living space? Yeah, Todd, can you adjust? Yep, yep. I, I, can, I can answer that. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and obviously that question has, um, you know, ramped up over the past, uh, you know, a few years. Um, we've done a few you know, robust studies for clients, um, uh, clients of uh, that had, you know, parking structures that were going to be long term uh, assets and, and what opportunities that they do have for building a parking structure for parking now um, and what options are there for future conversion. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I think the, uh, you know, the low hanging fruit um, and I think the economical thing to do is for the ground tier. Um, uh, it, it is very economical to design provisions in for a little bit of a higher first floor uh, so that when you do the functional design, um, you, you, you're thinking of other inclusion of other space, whether that be retail or other type of office or amenity space with that in mind. Um, that's a fairly inexpensive route to go. Um, it's been our experience um, with now conversion of levels uh, above, you know, the second level and up, um, that it is expensive, um, especially uh, with not knowing, um, you know, the current market and what the market driver would be for that particular use in the future. 
Um, so, you know, to convert levels um, above the ground tier could be as much as 20 to 25 percent. So the way the way we see uh, in, in the industry and the questions from a lot of our clients is really, let's take a look at the ground tier. Um, the next would be, let's take a look at the top level. Um, is there something that we can do on the top level uh, as an amenity, uh, right? Um, or design it as such that that could be converted. We've had, we've had a couple clients uh, where we've designed it for parking, whether it's one or two levels of parking, right? And then came back later uh, based on underutilization under of the structure and converted it to more of kind of a, an amenity deck. Um, right. So I guess the, to answer that is ground tier is certainly a low hanging fruit. It's very expensive to design a structure on the typical levels uh, to accommodate provisions for a market use that is maybe undetermined, um, but then also real estate on the top level should be explored. Thanks, Doug. I hope that answers, yeah. Thank you, Todd. Dave Sorrell asked, how have you all worked with change management and managing expectations with employees and or members of the public? How have you gone through raising rates and accommodating for mobility alternatives when the default paradigm has been parking should be cheap because I drive all the time? You know what, uh, Kenny, I'll try to address that fairly quickly. It's a long question, but um, we've recently worked with a, a public client uh, that was undertaking a major redevelopment of their downtown, which incorporated several very large surface parking lots, primarily for commuters. And that parking was very, very cheap and their their residents felt it should remain that way. But um, basically the plan that was put together because all, a lot of the parking now had to go into structures wasn't to replace it all. It was to replace what they perceived to be an adequate amount based on that using alternative mobility strategies like subsidized uh, Ubers or Lyft rides, bicycle parking, that type of thing, and then pricing. Obviously, the structures that will be built right adjacent to, in this case, the train station, were going to be priced significantly higher than underutilized assets that were further away, but still had availability. So the idea was reallocating parking based on pricing. It was obviously still people's choice, but then also maximizing the utilization of other alternative opportunities, which were different modes. Um, there's a town in New Jersey that has effectively run a Uber subsidy program versus building new facilities. And secondly, also, as, as Vicki mentioned, sharing existing assets. Um, in, in there are some, you know, be it a municipality or a third party entity to kind of agglomerate available, underutilized private or institutional assets and then make them available versus rebuilding um, or building more parking. So that I think is a pretty good example of, of, of that, you know, responding to that question, I hope. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, Richie Price asks, has the size of the parking space changed with the adoption of larger SUVs and pickup trucks? Has electric vehicle charging been impacting the planning and design, in particular medium charging versus high-speed fast charging? John, you want to address that? Uh, overall, the size of parking spaces haven't really changed. Um, eight foot six by 18 is you know pretty typical size. And that's really based off of um, manufactured vehicles and the 85th percentile of those manufactured vehicles are there. They really haven't, surprisingly, which you might think with the adoption of a lot of SUVs, the, the overall size or the average size of vehicles haven't really changed that much. It might be skewed a little bit on the on the larger side of the vehicles, but um, eight foot six is still pretty standard parking space size. As far as EV charging goes, um, really it's more of an operational thing. You know, placement of them inside of the garage isn't really, you know, have that much effect. Um, typically you're going to want to place them where it's going to be cost effective as far as the runs of electric and, and those types of things. But, you know, the turnover of those vehicles and having those vehicles turned over because they have finished charging is more of an operational issue. Um, rather than a, than a design issue. You know, often they are given kind of the most convenient spots as, con you know, contributing to the sustainability uh, certification yeah, of the garage, if that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, depending on certification, like Park Smart or LEED or something like that, they're typically, you're typically given points as far as placement goes. 
And one last question here from Kelly Dugdell. How are you taking into consideration the increased weight of EVs? In your instructor's design builds, EVs often weigh 30% 30 30 more than gas-powered vehicles, which someday might make up a majority of vehicles. Is that a concern? Uh, John, you want to, John or Todd, you want to go with that? Yeah, I mean, I can talk a little bit about, this is the EV question. About yes. the weight, yeah, the weight of the vehicles. Impact. Yeah, we did a study as far as the size of these, the uh, the vehicles, and they, they definitely are on the larger side, but the way that we have to design for these vehicles as far as code goes, right now, um, you know, you could stack up multiple vehicles in the drive aisle that are the size of some of these vehicles, and they are getting larger and heavier. So it might be something to look for in the future, but as of right now, the, the, the vehicles that are being manufactured out there, um, with maybe the exception of like the Hummer EV vehicle, which is like excessively large, but typically you're not going to have, you know, a full garage of Hummer EV uh, design vehicles for to, to design for an entire parking structure. So it's, it's not really right now, it's not mm -hmm. of, a, of a structural concern. And, and I think if I if I could just add to that, and John, I think as 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 the, the you know things progress, right, and uh, the bigger vehicles, you know, becomes a concern of the weight and so forth, you're going to see probably more uh, designed and located at the uh, on grade level, right? So on grade, you know, that that's a combination as well of the fire concern. So you'll probably see um, those start to be placed where there is a, a necessity uh, on a slab on grade location. Thanks, Todd. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody for joining us today. Any last words from our presenters? No, we just want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, wish you, I know it's a busy time of year and wish you all a very happy and healthy holiday season. We can thank be of any so assistance. Let us please let us know. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And thank I want to thank Jim. Oh, I want to thank Jim, Todd, John, and Vicky for hosting today's learning lab. And we thank you for joining us today. Have a great day, everybody. You as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much.